Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. This show is all about showcasing entrepreneurs who are building businesses in this exciting part of the world. From reading high-level articles about the region, it can be difficult to really understand what's going on. And so my hope is that these interviews somewhat bring it to life, as well as stoking your curiosity to go find out more. On that, do take a look in the archive for more episodes that we've done. But for now, let's enjoy the rest of this funky intro music and then get started with the show. Pharmacies are found in almost every community in East Africa. However, the way in which they are currently operating leaves a lot of room for improvement. The business is largely run from pen, paper and phone, meaning shop owners don't have the visibility on how everything is run. Beyond this though, there's a huge potential to drive change in the medical space through formalising the way in which medicine is delivered across the region. In this episode, Jess Vernon, CEO of Maisha Meds and I, discuss how her technology company is using data to improve how local pharmacies are run and their ambitions to transform the broader industry. Without any further ado, here is Jess. So, we're here today with Jess from Maisha Meds. Jess, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so, just to get us started, can you tell us a bit about you and a bit about Maisha Meds? Sure. Uh, so I first moved to East Africa, to Kenya, about eight years ago. I was working for an economics research organization doing operations research uh, and scaling programs and started becoming really interested in the health sector in East Africa and how it worked. And so from there, kind of went to medical school, but always wanted to come back here. And so about four years ago, started looking at how we could better support uh, private sector healthcare. And how we could better make sure that they had that these pharmacies and clinics had high quality medicines, and so started my Asia Meds kind of out of understanding uh, exactly what the needs were in that space and wanting to build technology to support it. Very cool. So basically, you started off doing projects out here, and then you went back to become a doctor or to be medical staff. Yes. And then you came back. Yes. All right. Is that? It's, yeah. Don't most people do it the other way around? They do, but I, so I had already been here and I knew that I wanted to come back. And so I actually chose medical school and the program I went to based on knowing that I wanted the flexibility to kind of do both at the same time. Oh, right. So this has been like a long time in the pipeline. Yeah. I see. All right. And so like Maisha Meds, it means it supports the medical sector or, you know, what, what sort of, in a sentence, what is it? Uh, so we have a technology solution, a point of sale system that pharmacies and clinics use to log all of their medicines. And then we use that data that's generated there to provide them with supply chain solutions to connect them with good suppliers, and then to, to actually support patients to ensure that they're getting um, medical adherence advice and, and follow up. I see. So I'm, so your customers are physical uh, pharmacies that individual customers go to? Yes. Cool. So it's not sort of the, it's not higher up the chain, it's sort of like down on the ground. Yeah, so we have this big ops team out in Western Kenya that goes door to door to pharmacies and, and sells them software. All right. How many pharmacies are there in Western Kenya? In Western Kenya, there's a few thousand. We're in about 120 currently. How did you get the number of few thousand? There's actually not great mapping of, of what which pharmacies are there, but we know there's about 6,000 licensed in Kenya. And since over half the population is out in that part of the country, we assume it's about half. Yeah, okay, cool. That's it. So, um, and, but there is, so, oh, so every pharmacy has to have a license. And that's that way you can know there's that, many, there's that many. Yeah, there's many more that don't have a license, but we try to support the ones that do. I see. Got it. Okay. And so, okay, so you, you'll only take Maisha Med's software to licensed pharmacies. Or at least you'll try to. We try to, yeah. Yeah. That's good. So why don't all pharmacies get a license? Uh, so many of much of it has to do with the training of the owner and the, the attendant. They have to be a licensed pharmacist and farm tech, and they have to go through a lot of training to do that. And so the Pharmacy and Poisons Board makes sure that that happens to get a license. It's called the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. That sounds quite exciting. Yeah. The ph- Pharmacy and Poisons. All right. Um, all right. So how long does it take to become a trained pharmacist? Uh, it takes four years to be a pharmacist and two years to be a farm tech. Farm tech. It's like a light version of a pharmacist. Oh, I see. Oh, like a pharmaceutical technician. Yes. Kind of thing. Got it. Okay. Right. Okay. So you're currently in 120 of roughly, you know, however many thousand there are out there. How did you get to those first 120? Was it door to door? So it was, it was really interesting. It, there was a long ramp up. We started with about 12 a, a few years ago. 
and really iterated on the software with them and understood more about their needs. And then as of last year, we had, we've had this extraordinary software developer who's kind of revamped the whole app and we launched it in January and grew from 12 to 120 over that year. And most of it's due to referrals from existing clients, though we also have kind of door-to-door marketers do some things. Yeah, okay, so you've got, you just so you have your, your early adopters, let's say. Okay. Yeah. So you, so you work so in kind of classic sort of lean startup way, I guess, you sort of work with your early adopters. Yeah. What were some of the surprising features that they asked for? Uh, credit. Uh, they all, or many of them, give 0% interest loans to their patients who can't afford medicines, and they wanted to be able to track that because currently often the patients forget to pay or aren't able to pay. They want to follow up. Okay. So the pharmacy would just give out the medicine yeah. and say, do you want to come back in next week and pay? And then they just have to remember it in their head. Yep. I see. All right. and, uh, and so how do you make it easier? Uh, for that, we collect the phone number of the patient and the amount of money that they owe. And then we have a tracking device to make sure that if they pay, they reconcile the payment. I see. And so it's, it's the pharmacy who's calling up the customers, not you. Yeah, they just want to be able to track it. That's it. Cool. Okay. And any other sort of features that are quite, quite nifty? Uh, so we're also SMSing receipts to, to patients. And last fall, we started doing uh, health tips as well to, to be able to capture the patient's phone number and then send them SMSs when they need to take their medicine. Like say they have anti-malarials that they purchase, they should take it for three days. And we tell them kind of each time they should be taking it. Oh, cool. Do, I mean, are the pa- patients, customers, are they okay with it? Sort of receiving this text from this Random number? They opt in. So oh, okay. if they don't right. want to, they don't okay. have the phone number. Right. Nice. And so will the um yeah, I mean so how how does the dynamic work in terms of when I've got a yeah, if I'm a pharmacy, am I saying you know, we're partnering with Weisha Meds and so they'll be sending you some communication? Or is it very much the 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 relationship is is sort of completely between pharmacy and customer? And just behind the scenes, they've got my instruments. Yeah, no, it's a great question. We don't we don't actually know how they frame it when they ask if the patient wants health tips. But I would assume that they say we have the option of providing you these this SMS. Would you want it? I see. Oh, so it doesn't say like powered by my meds. Not in the SMS, no. No. Okay. Not in the SMS. But does that mean there's parts of it where they are? Well, the the software the software is all Android based, and so the, the person who's interacting with the software sees sees that they're using. Maisha Med software, but the patient usually doesn't see that. So they'll say, give me your phone number, we'll send you health tips, and then they enter it. Understood. Hey, right. And I think pharmacies pay pay for this service. Yes. Yeah. What's the rough cost? Well, so they, it, that's also interesting, actually. So the, the software itself is free, but as part of starting to work with each of these pharmacies, we usually have to go count everything that's on their shelves and enter it into the system. So say you have the, these anti-malarials, these antibiotics, and they, they want to pay us for that. So they usually pay us about $80 uh, for the training and stock take. And then they'll buy tablets and Bluetooth printers and things from us as well. Cool. Oh, cool. So you've got some hardware yeah. that you sell to mm-hmm. Where do you get your hardware from? Uh, the most recent round we got discounted from Safaricom, but we use the Alcatel distributor here. You get good good wholesale prices. Excellent. All right. And so the, so, okay, so the, the, the pharmacy, they, they're paying for the devices? Yes. Cool. And do they have the cash, cash available to do it or do they need to get credit to, to do that? Sometimes they have to get credit. A lot of them will pay completely out of pocket, but we'll also just ask for a $100 down payment and then they can pay the remainder as they want. All right, so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is like, what's, the, what's the rough setup cost? Yeah. Uh, so it's anywhere, if they have their tablet, it's $80, but you, most of them pay somewhere between two and $300 for it. Okay. And how do you convince them that's a good investment? It's really interesting. Most of the reason p- pharmacies want to use this is that the, the owner is away from the shop during the day and they want to be able to see what's happening in their shop and do their orders from a distance. Many of them work in government hospitals and can't make it home to monitor the, their attendance. So they like to be able to, to see what's happening at a glance. Ah, oh, okay. So it's more, it's less of a, this is going to increase your business by X necessarily and more just this is just going to give you that visibility. Yeah, currently it's the visibility. The kind of the big thing that we're doing this year is what 2018 is focused on is is taking the data that they've logged and actually giving them medication packages that they can order from suppliers and then also giving them kind of quality guarantees and things like that. And so we're hoping that that will help them grow their business and and save on uh, medication. But currently it's just the the oversight that they like. 
<laughs> when you say medication packages, do you mean like we can see that you're buying a lot of these at quite high price if you both you know, batch them together? Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, we have some data scientists working on how to do forecasting, and we have price lists from a bunch of suppliers and are trying to trying to figure out how to optimize for them. To get the best prices and the best quality of medicine. All right. what, what is the most popular medicine in Western Kenya? The most popular is the kind of standard painkillers, acetaminophen, but the I think the number three and four is anti-malarials. So uh, are the common artemisinin-based combo therapies. And then metronidazole, which is for like if you have a stomach infection. Yeah. And where, where, did, where are these medicines made? All, so each of those is, has brands from all over the world that, that make things like that, but many of them are made in India and China. And so there's kind of like an existing supply chain? Yeah. Cool. And do they usually come into like a, whole, a Kenyan wholesaler you're going to buy it from, or are you doing these connections with, these, with each individual producer? There's usually three or four touch points before the pharmacy purchases the medicine. We're trying to work a little bit further up the supply chain. So we get to the first or second touch point once it's imported. And most of those are actually in Nairobi. So there's a bit of an interesting question around how, as we introduce more Nairobi suppliers to Western Kenya we'll, and try to grow their market share, what will, what will happen? What do you think will happen? It's possible that the, that the more local suppliers will try to cut costs in some way, though in many cases they're Kind of what they compete on is cost already, and so it'll it'll be interesting to see. I'm I'm not actually sure at this point. Yes, all that all that to be seen. Right? Yeah. Cool. What's it called, Maisha Meds? Maisha means uh, life in Swahili. Okay, life meds. Cool. And what, what was the second name when you were going through it? What what like what were they some of the other options? Well, so we actually first started calling it Miti Health, which is a name that was terrible for many reasons. One of which is that Miti is like trees, and we had thought at that point we were going to do decision tree algorithms but it turns out that actually has this like herbal connotation in Kenya and they thought we were selling like herbal like medicines or like witchcraft medicines it was yeah okay it was not a great name safer to go with life yeah okay very cool and so why did you choose western Kenya as the place to start this so i'd been based in kisumu for two years before medical school so that was what i knew best but it's also for whatever reason we got a lot more traction there we started in nairobi at first and we just found that kisumu was much better for the iterative phase of things people were much more willing to provide feedback and work with something that was a little bit less uh that was a little buggy and imperfect at first okay all right and have they had like has anyone tried to solve it this way before or like, like what are some of the other ways which people have tried to solve this problem like is, is this yeah. is it that they're like oh another another com- another software company coming into it or were they like oh this is a bit new well so our ultimate goal is to improve medication and diagnostic quality and affordability and so we're trying to do that at the level of the at the pharmacy or clinic there's lots of companies that have tried to solve kind of this quality problem Sproxel is the one that everybody cites first. It, they do the, like the scratch off barcode things um, on medications, and and there's a lot of others that kind of work behind the scenes to do similar things. But a lot of them don't quite reach the pharmacy level, or they're underused by the pharmacy. So we're kind of the first we think to be able to get to to that level and kind of trace back upwards through the supply chain. But it's it's much more. It's very slow going. Sometimes you're like. <laughs> courting individual pharmacies for like weeks to get you know to make an individual sale so Got it. yeah so i mean is that why people haven't done it before that it is just really difficult or, or is there another fundamental reason why well th- so there are there are plenty there are point of sale systems that exist in kenya most of them are built in kenya by kenyan developers and are fantastic systems the difference that we have the difference of what we're doing from those is that they're just like just a point of sale system that sits on a desktop that tracks your medicines we're trying to use leverage the data to like work across the supply chain got it okay and i imagine i don't think i mean is there is there any resistance to what you do early on we had to get a a lot of buy-in from the pharmacists and clinics around around data keeping their data private and anonymous. So before anyone would work with us, we had to put in place a like privacy agreement, data security rules, and kind of how we would how we would access and use data, which was really surprising to me at the time that they were savvy enough to ask for it, but but they were. 
physical. Yeah. And so now you sort of have all your data stored securely. Yeah. For them. Okay. It's um, not accessible by pretty much anyone. And you say that it's free, the software's free. Mm-hmm. So how do you make money? So we we cover our operations costs through the the money that they pay upfront for the system, and then we charge a small fee on the the medic medication reorders that that we're making. And we're also in the process right now of working with manufacturers and suppliers to get even bigger discounts on the medicines that are that we're offering, and then we'll take a small percentage of that as well. Cool. Okay. So is, is the strategy at the moment just get in and kind of suck it up and just make sure you're everywhere? And then in time, you'll make your money back. We hope. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's in, yeah, as opposed to like trying to be profitable from day one. It's yeah. like, this is like a network effect where yeah. it makes sense to be the end. Yeah, we think so. See. All right, cool. And um, how are you funding that? We have a lot of grant funding at this point. So we have uh, very generous funding from the Gates Foundation and GIZ and the Dyer Afti Foundation, all of which have seen that there's kind of this this huge network of these pharma- the, these drug shops. There, a lot of them aren't even pharmacies, and they're providing a lot of care. And they want to be able to build build out those networks and and help them do it better. So it's a it's a mix of both a for profit and a non profit model. I see. Okay. And when it comes to the when it comes to let's say the Gates Foundation, what are like what are the questions they're asking of you to make sure that you deserve their money? So we uh, the, we were funded through their kind of access to healthcare initiative to and their focus there is on private sector supply chains so and the the problem that we're solving for them is this last mile problem that they you'll hear them talk very very commonly about and so the the big question for them is how are you know are these are these pharmacies and drug shops actually interested in this like are they using it regularly and like how do you make sure that it actually improves the supply chain and doesn't just make you money Cool. And how do you, how do you answer that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're, I mean, what we're doing is still very much a work in progress, but we think that we have, we're on the, like each, every day we get a little bit closer to being on to something and thinking that, that we are really starting to understand how all these puzzle pieces fit together. And so we just try to kind of update all of these stakeholders as much as possible and help them take them along with our learnings in all of this. Got it. Cool. Are there plans to basically, sorry, to move beyond Western Kenya? Or sorry, I'll rephrase. At what point will you move beyond Western Kenya? So we oh, we currently take referrals from anywhere in Kenya. So we will go to kind of very rural parts around the Lake Mugori and Suba area. I and mean, out to Siaya, where Obama's grandma is based. I and mean, we have a few in Nairobi. But we're also in conversations with a few par- potential partners in Nigeria and Tanzania to not have so much on the ground operations but work through a partner to to have the software there as well okay so in in other parts of east africa and west africa Mm -hmm. it's a similar similar it's a similar problem but also it's kind of the setup the infrastructure is similar enough yeah i see and so so now yeah i mean it's it's just amazing how like it's if you say it's a very big problem and no one's actually thought about doing it in we might have thought about it. Do you have any thoughts or reservations about going to other countries in, in Africa? I definitely. I, we we don't feel like we've fully solved the or fully built the model here in Kenya yet. You know, if if reordering and supply chains is our ultimate goal, we want to make sure we're actually like doing the things that we that we say we're going to do before moving to other geographies. But we've had enough inbound interest from people who just want the point of sale system that we're like, well, we'll give you what we've already built and start building kind of an understanding of the market there through the data. And then if we want to do more there, we can we can do that as well. That's very good. And um, what's been the biggest surprise since starting my insurance? So many. I think the the thing that was the biggest I my background's kind of economics and medical and kind of seeing we over in the beginning we really struggled with the tech side of things and building really excellent technology, and it's been such a surprise what a difference like a really stellar stellar developer makes versus like a less next level like less stellar one. I um, mean we've managed to build this really amazing team, especially recently, that has kind of propelled us to new levels and allowed us to be more ambitious, which has been cool. How has technology allowed you to propel? Just having, I mean, 
the the difference between what what a really talented software engineer is building versus like someone who kind of knows the process. And I guess probably also like the product side of things that we have our technical director really thinks through like every step of exactly how someone thinks about each screen. And I know that's like that's super you would think that's super straightforward, but the difference between like doing that really well and doing it less well is the difference between a product people love and people one that people oh. just like. Got it. Cool. So best tech means it's something which comes out. Well, now it's in a stage where people are like, I'm going to refer this to my friends. Yeah. And so as a result, that's what scores the growth. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I'm with you now. In terms of like your sales force, how many people do you have out on the ground doing that? We have, so we have three full-time staff members, an ops director and a marketer and an ops associate. And then we have a really great team of interns as well that kind of support the stock takes and the marketing and things. It's a team of about, I think it just grew today. So I, I think it's at eight or 10 currently. Yeah, great. Cool. Uh, and what's the, the rough sales cycle in terms of time? It's interesting because it depends on the time of year. You must know like people have money at certain times and don't at other times. And it also depends, you know, the beginning of the month is different than the end. So you'll often see that there's like, People will just tell you, you know, I'll, I'll be ready next month, next month. And then all of a sudden, like, bam, they have money and they can they can invest in things. So usually it's it'll be anywhere from like someone emails us on the website and um, they want something next week to like we, you know, wait six months and keep calling people. <laughs> okay. Out of interest, what normally call, causes the bam? You said they go weeks, 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 and suddenly bam, they got the money. But what's what's caused, caused that windfall? I'm not actually sure. I think that there's just seasonality to how people have money in Kenya. Like a lot of it, people still earn a lot of money from from farming. And I think when, you know, during the harvest season, people have a lot more money for different things. And then that trickles up through all, you know, people have more money for medicines and, you know, pharmacists have more money for systems. See, well, also, things like that. Well, it means it's, it's not that the pharmacy, the pharmacist is also a farmer. No, it's just that the economy is built on. Okay, so, so, exactly. so they're, 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 yeah, their local economy, everyone starts to get more money, they then get it. Yeah. And we've also seen that in uh, in December, there seems to be a spike in sales. And it, we think it's because in these rural areas where we work, people will be coming home from Nairobi and, and buying medicine for their family for like to keep them stocked up for a while. Hmm. So that seasonality as well. Perfect. What's sort of like the rough revenue that a rural pharmacist will get a year? We usually do our estimates on about $12,000 a year. Okay. And that, you can say that sort of spikes in December and, and any other sort of high points? I don't know if we've had enough data for long enough to see. We'll, hopefully this year we'll know better. But in terms of the sort of climate, so I'm going to, it's like, so I'm from the UK. Yeah. And I can imagine that pharmacies get a boom in the winter. Because suddenly everyone's got coming in for cold medicines and, yeah. and what is there? Is there any sort of I don't know seasonal? Yeah. So last year is the first year we ha- really had powerful data from a large group, and it was actually a fair, a very unusual year, as you know, because of both of the elections. And so we we've never we haven't seen any like big spikes in things, but we did see huge drop offs in the week or two right around each election. So that but that's the only real trend we were able to see last year. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, so we sort of touched on it a little bit, but if you were to look on the next, let's say, six months, what would my Meds look like? Uh, in six months, we will have launched the ability to handle reorders. Hopefully, we will we'll have done a couple iterations on it with a ton of learnings in there. And then hopefully, we'll be processing recurrent, our current assumptions are a quarter of orders for a quarter of pharmacies and growing from there. So a quarter of the orders made by, by a quarter of our pharmacies. So they'll they'll be looking to us and kind of using our reordering system about a quarter of twenty five percent of the time. Understood. Sorry. So as in they currently have their own means of ordering stuff in. Yeah. And your your big thing is like, guys, come do it on our platform. Yeah, they all do it over the phone, like hundreds of medicines each month. <laughs> so. so as in as in they'll say like seven of they just of yeah. like number one. Yeah. Sixty three of them. Yeah. All right. And usually they'll call around to like three different guys and be like, what's your order on, you know, what's today's rate on this? What's today's rate on that? And, you know, it's like paracetamol and like yeah. paracetamol. Well, there's there's quite a sort of fluctuations in the price. But then it's not like a, you've got a catalog, this is the fixed price. People will be like, oh, yeah, it's $3. 
Yeah. Actually, there's all these interesting, I'm now on all these supplier WhatsApp threads where every day they'll send their, their like discounts on medicines that they send to pharmacies. Uh, what, what causes a discount? Spikes in demand or dips in demand, the, okay. the reverse. Or if something's expired sometime soon, they'll sell it really quickly. Oh, I see. So they just got their stock and they're like, yeah, I need to shift it today. Yeah. I see. All right. So are you going to partner with these guys on the WhatsApp groups? Uh, we think so. But we, I mean, we're partners with them on their price list, but we'd like to be able to take into account the daily discounts as well. Yeah. Is that going to be, is that going to feature in the ability to reorder through your platform? Like, how, I'm, I'm trying to get this. I can imagine technology gets a lot easier to be like, the price of price each month is X. But then if, in reality, the price changes every day, like, how's that going to, that seems like it might be a bit of a... Yeah, I think that's one of the learnings for the next few months, exactly how how to input all of that and whether what we're hoping to do is to be able to do kind of larger tenders and and negotiated prices that actually get us a little bit lower than the discounts regardless but we'll we'll kind of do both for a little while and see see what the trends actually are there's a lot of stuff going on do you think it will get to a state where you end up holding stuff i hope not but possibly or what will most likely happen is that for distributors that don't have a kasumu office we would they would send us like one big bulk order and we would repackage and send out the same day. Okay. Well, so you might, you might need to have that bit of operational bit. Yeah. We don't, we don't want a warehouse. So. Okay. <laughs> We're a tech company. Yeah. Good to see. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So has there been, I mean, it sounds like quite a fundamental behavior to change. Is it? I'm on the phone. I'm doing it now. To, I've got to trust, I've got to poke at this tablet and I've got to hope that it's, um, how yeah. are you going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's one of the the places where uh, having someone with a really great knowledge of product is invaluable. There's a few pieces to to making those nudges towards behavior change. One is being able to do the forecasts automatically, and then we have this really talented data scientist who's who's basically finding out what the equivalent medicine is across the range of suppliers and doing price optimization across them to be able to say this is pretty definitively what the best option is for you at, for this order that you want to make at the forecasted amount we think you need. And so we think if we can get it to one click ordering, they'll be keen to at least try it. And then we think the big financial incentive is we're working with a partner to provide credit as well. So you order from us, you get it on credit for 30 days. And, you, and a lot of these pharmacies don't are really motivated by credit and don't have a lot of it currently. Very cool. Right. So just ask, a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, so that's what it looks like in six months. Three years? What, what does it look like? So if we have a large enough network, we can really start to drive how how both pharmacies and suppliers kind of think about their supply chains. My like my medical background keeps coming back into this is like we need more diagnostics sold in each in all of these pharmacies. We need to make sure that they're only selling evidence based medicines. And you can start to be able to like shift how large volumes of people order and access medicines if you get a large enough network. So it's in ensuring that the right medicine is going into the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Medicines and diagnostics. And like, what do you mean by diagnostics? So pharmacies are now allowed in Kenya to sell like HIV self-tests. They're, they're, they're not, not allowed. They, they are, are allowed. allowed. They're, it, just recently, it was this year, or 2017. So now that you can walk into any, any pharmacy and buy a self-test. Right. Well, why, out of interest, why couldn't you do that before? Uh, you had to go through a clinician. You had to go to a nurse and they had to do the test for you. And then you had to get counseling afterwards. Now you can do it from home. Oh, cool. Got it. Very good. And people listening at home, how can they learn more about Maisha Meds? You're on social media, etc. We are on social media, Twitter at Maisha Meds, and then we have a website, MaishaMeds.org. Very cool. And if there are any pharmacists, pharmacies listening, how do, do they just go via the website and they can figure it all out? Yep. Go ahead and contact us and we'd, we'd love to have you on the system. Very cool. Awesome. Well, Jess, thanks so much. Thank you so much. This has been great. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see show notes for this episode by heading to www.samfloy.com forward slash podcast. That's S-A-M-F-L-O-Y dot com forward slash podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast and stay updated on future episodes, as well as a few other things like behind the scenes pictures, then please check out our Facebook page. Search for the East Africa Business Podcast and you can like it from there. Finally, if you felt this was a good episode, then please do leave a rating for the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. 
it helps others like you find the show and I for one would really appreciate it. In any case, have a great week and speak to you soon.